It's hard to believe our lectureship this year is nearly over, but it's been a good lectureship. I think uh, I've enjoyed all the lessons, every single one, and I think everybody's done a good job in doing and preparing for those lectures. And I think it's been a very timely lectureship and very in a lot of different ways, but also it's been very profitable for each one of us as listeners. The second and third chapters of the book of Revelation are written to the seven churches of Asia. Now this Asia is not what we call Asia. It's really a Roman province in what we would refer to as the Middle East or what we would call Turkey. Now the seven churches of Asia are these. You have Ephesus and to help you see it on the map, I don't know about you, but that's, you know, I'm always interested to see it on a map and I know that the map is small, but maybe you'd be able to see it. If not, maybe you have a pair of binoculars in your pocket or something. But nonetheless, I think you'll be able to see it. But Ephesus is one of the places that Paul worked. He helped plant the church there in Ephesus or appears to have helped plant the church in Ephesus. John also must have worked there at least for a time period. Then you have Smyrna going north and Smyrna was uh, probably planted by the apostles during or maybe some of the members that had been taught but planted by uh, Paul and his companions. Also you have Pergamon and if we talked about Pergamon in the last lesson and a lot of interesting things about Pergamon and then you have the city of Thyatira known for its dyes and that's why Lydia and mentioned again in the previous lesson Lydia was from Thyatira she was a seller of purple because the fabric and the purple that would have come from that particular place then you have Sardis and Sardis is what we are going to look at this morning in this particular lesson we're going to focus on that here in just a little bit then you have Philadelphia and finally Laodicea to the south now Laodicea we know quite a bit about the church in Laodicea because of the book of of Ephesians and also because of the book of, of uh, Philemon. But anyway, those are the seven churches of Asia. Now each of the letters to the seven churches, and that's what you have in chapters two and three, they can be divided basically in the same way. In the first part of each of these letters is the commission given to the seven churches. And what we mean by the, com the commission is the, well, it, each letter begins with unto the, ch unto the angel of the church at, and you then fill in the rest. In all seven churches, you have the same commission. Then you have the character. Now, not the character of the church. He will deal with that later on, but this is actually the character of the author who, who, authored the things that are said within this. In other words, it's really about the character of Jesus. And we'll look at that concerning the letter to Sardis. And then you have the commendation. Now, the commendation are the commendations that Jesus made with reference to each of the churches. In other words, those qualities that they needed to build upon and he would then address those different things. Then you have the condemnation. Now the condemnation would be those things that, that needed to be corrected. And those things that was lacking or that was wrong with those churches. Then you have the correction. And the correction would be those admonitions that Jesus then provided for each church the things that they needed to do. And basically, those corrections were those things addressed previously with reference to the condemnation and the things that they needed to, to straighten out. 
Then you had a call. And the call was a warning, or really in some cases, a consequence of what would happen if they do not make the corrections. And then finally, you have the challenge given to each church. And the challenge was the promise of good if they made the, the corrections that they needed to make. Now, with the church of Sardis, you have all seven of those things. They're not in the order that other churches had them. Now, in the early letters with the reference to Ephesus and others, they followed basically this pattern that he went through. But with the church of Sardis, it, it's a little bit out of order, but all seven of those things are found there. Now, our purpose is to look at the exhortation to the church at Sardis and to see what we can glean from it and learn from the exhortation to the church at Sardis. Now, we're going to go through each one of these things and I'm going to note each one with reference to the church at Sardis. And verse 1 is the first thing, is the commission. And he says, unto the angel of the church in Sardis write. Well, to understand this particular section of the book of Revelation, we know it was apocryphal language, and, and so we need to look at and consider the figures that are used there. The word angel simply means a messenger. That's all the word actually means, messenger. And it only makes sense, and really because of what he said later on with reference to the character of, of Jesus, then it only makes sense as reference to the preacher of the local congregation. In other words, the local preacher. Now, he used the singular there, but it doesn't mean that there were only one preacher. It could have been several preachers in a lot of different congregations. In fact, when you look at the church at Colossae, which was no real difference in any of these congregations, they had several men who could preach <coughs> And they then did preach and share in that responsibility, at least to some extent. But he was the messenger to the church. He then provided the message for the congregation. And so that would, would be the reference of the angel. Now, as far as the city of Sardis was concerned, it was one of the oldest cities. It was actually the capital of Lydia, which was a Roman province within Asia. Now, if you notice on that map, it had Asia there, marked as Asia, but there was a province of Lydia that was a part of that. The city of Sardis was an interesting city. If you've ever seen a picture of it, and I don't want to go into a lot of detail about Sardis, but it was built on a hill. And the old part of the city, or the oldest part of the city, and the foundations that are still there, and the different things that are still there, the remnants of that city, was way up on the hill. In fact, it was about 1,500 feet above the plains. Now, 1,500 feet is good long ways. Now, think about it this way. When you come across on Highway 20 going toward Owasso from Claremore, you're only going up. Now, we're talking about Keatonville Hill. The top of Keatonville Hill to the river is only 200 feet. Now, if you take the average size of a, of a story of a building is 10 to 12 feet, but if you take it at 10 feet, then you're talking about a 20 story building. Well, Sardis was on the hill that was seven times, a little bit more than seven times greater than Keatonville Hill. Now that gives you a perspective of how high Sardis was and how it would look over the valley. And that's important because he, like all the churches of Asia, in every single one, the significance of the city and the character of the city itself played a role in the language that John or that brother Jesus chose for that. Now, the next thing we have is character. Remember, this is not the character of the church, but rather the character of the individual given the message. And that is with reference to Jesus. He's the author of it. 
He says, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now the seven spirits of God is relatively easy to understand. The word seven or the number seven in apocryphal language means perfection. And so it's the perfect spirits of God. And that would be a reference to the Holy Spirit. It is also interesting that that's mentioned over in chapter 1 and verses 4 and 5. Now chapter 1 verses 4 and 5, John wrote, John to the seven churches which are in age of grace be unto you and peace from God, from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now notice all three persons of the Godhead are mentioned in this particular passage. He said, from him which, which is and which was and which is to come was, would be a reference then to the Father. And then the seven spirits, as I've already mentioned, is a reference to the Holy Spirit. And then in verse number five, he mentions Jesus Christ plainly from Jesus Christ who is faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead. Not first in order, but the greatest or the preeminent one, begotten of the dead. Now the seven stars are also easy to understand. In fact, in chapter 1 and verse 20, he clearly tells us what the seven stars are. In Revelation 1.20, he says, The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now remember, the word angel simply means messenger. And what does a star do? A star is, is a symbol of light. And so since the messengers are this symbol of light, the stars, it only makes sense that he's talking about the preacher and he's giving that message of light, the gospel message to the congregation so they would know which direction that they needed to, to go. So then we get to the commendation. Now verse 4 is the commendation, as I said, with reference to the church at Sardis. It is not in order, it is out of order, but nonetheless it is the commendation. He says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now one of the saddest things as far as the church at Sardis, he said, Thou hast a few names. That's all. Just a few names. Sadly, there were only a few Christians in Sardis that were, that were living as they should. They had not defiled their garments. Now, the idea of garments and defiling garments is a figure that's taken from the Old Testament. It's also used in Paul's writings to both the church and Ephesus and also the church at Colossae. In fact, in Ephesus of the, the book of Ephesians and the book of Colossians, he deals with it to great detail. And this is a reference to morality and it's a reference to living godly lives. They had not defiled their garment means they are living like God wanted them to live. They're living holy and morally. And as a result, he said, and they shall walk with me, that is with Jesus, and they shall walk with me in white. Well, because white is used for purity, then it could be that he's, he's saying, he's emphasizing again, not only did they not defile their garment, but they shall also not defile their garments. They're walking in white. Now, I, don't, I personally don't think that that's really what he's talking about. I think what he's talking about is the result. Because they did not defile their garment, the result then is they would walk with Jesus in white, and white sometimes is a symbol of joy and victory. And that's what those that would not defile their garments, they would have the victory, they would be overcomers in the gospel. They would then be the ones that would be rewarded with the victory in Jesus. Now the reason 
that they would be able to walk with Jesus in this victory is, he says, they are worthy. Now, looking at this idea of they are worthy, it, it's not that they were worthy because of their own righteousness. You know, it really goes back all the way through the scriptures. And especially with Israel, God reminded Israel they did not have this victory because of their own righteousness. And brethren, we will not have the victory because of our own righteousness. It's not going to happen that way because every single one of us commits sin and every one of us falls short. And so it's not going to be because of our own righteousness. It's going to be because of the redemption in Christ through his blood. They were worthy because they turned to Christ and were forgiven of their sins. Now, I'm like Bill. I can't be like people that think that they can do anything that they want to do. In fact, it re really reminds me of Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? <clears throat> Forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized in Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? And therefore we are buried with him by baptism and death. And he went on to talk about those very things. We cannot just continue in sin and think that we can pray at the evening time with like the namesake of Bill's or Bill's namesake or maybe, well, I guess it's Bill's namesake in one way or another. But nonetheless, nonetheless, we cannot be like that kind of a person. We've got to, to strive to live righteously if we're going to have the victory. Well, next we get to the condemnation. That's verses 1 and 2. He said, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Now, there are basically three statements in the letters to the seven churches of Asia that you find in every single one of them. You have the beginning, he said, unto the angel of the church at, and those um, are found in every single one. You also have the ending. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I said a little bit different ways, but it's found in every single one of them near the end of this. And within the middle of the exhortation, you have the statement, I know thy works. And it's found in every single letter to the seven churches. I know thy works. And in fact, what I would do is I would note those three things. Because if something is noted three different ways, times or seven different times those three statements are noted seven different times through the seven churches you think it's an important thing to remember yeah it's important that we remember those those particular things i know thy works you know what really that's saying god is omniscient there is no one and no church that God does not know their works. You know, the fact is, God is all-knowing. We know he's all-knowing. And sometimes we get to thinking about, well, I can do this or I can do that in the privacy of my home or, you know, in secret and different things like that. And nobody's not going to know. Well, two people know. The person who did it does it. And God. He knows our thoughts, and he probably knows us as far as our physical attributes better than we know ourselves. I mean, he knows the number of hair on our head. Who knows that? I don't know about you. I don't go around counting the hair on my head. <laughs> I don't have a lot to count, but at least not as much as I used to have. But nonetheless, God knows us. He knows who we are. And you know, he also knows the congregation here at Ulicom. And he knows the characteristics of this congregation. I know thy works. Then he said, 
that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Now that's really a statement that's not unlike other statements that are made within Scripture. In fact, Paul would write about the widow who was living but yet dead. And Jesus talked about the man that was living and yet dead. And so when you look at this particular statement, we have to say, what in the world is he talking about? How can you be alive and yet be dead? How can it be both ways? Well, it's because he's looking at two different things. They were alive physically, but they were dead spiritually. The church at Sardis was a church that was known to be active and alive. But you know, they weren't alive in the right things. That was the whole point. They had the appearance of being alive, but in actuality, they were dead spiritually as far as the most part of them. Now, there were a few, obviously, who maintained the faith, who were doing what they ought to do, but for the most part, they were only alive in the physical and not in the spiritual. Now, do you know congregations like that? Uh, yeah. You look out through the brotherhood. I know congregations that, oh, as far as their benevolence programs are concerned, they are very much alive. And they do all kinds of things to help other people as far as their physical needs are concerned. But you know, all that does, now I'm not saying that we ought not be benevolent because we ought to be. But that all that does is align ourselves with the denominational world, the sectarian world. All kinds of sectarian people out there are benevolent people. And the religious people of the world no matter what kind of religion, they are benevolent people. That aligns ourselves with them. But I also know churches that, well, they are really good about <laughs> fellowship meals. They're really good about potluck dinners. They're really good about helping one another with feeding and things like that. And they have the appearance of being active when those things are important but they're not really what's most important. I remember I was a young man, just started preaching, visited a particular congregation and just was kind of curious about the kind, kind of congregation it was. And one day just showed up on the doorstep, knocked on the door, spoke to the preacher, and he walked me into the auditorium because the preachers like to brag about their church buildings. And he says, this is our fellowship hall. Now, he was making a point, but really the point was well taken. You see, the real fellowship is here in this room, not in the back room. The real fellowship is when we blend our voices together, when we commune together, when we give together, when we have teaching together, when we pray together. That's the real fellowship. And that's what we need to be in actively involved in. Those are spiritual things. And not so much the physical things. But also no congregations that are really good about having a game night. Or brethren that will get together and, and they'll organize and spend hours upon hours upon hours to have some type of activity to go to some ball game or something like that together nothing wrong with that in and of itself but is that really what we're about I remember when I first became a Christian and we were working with a, a, or a member of the congregation and we decided to take a group of kids to an amusement park and it was really kind of a reward for, for the kids to go to this amusement park and so we had a bus and we took a bus load of kids. And I remember thinking to myself, most of these kids don't even attend. Here they are getting the benefits of the physical stuff and yet they're not spiritual minded. And I thought, how unfair. Well, you know, the world continues on. 
But don't you know a lot of churches that are actively involved in the physical, but then they forget about the spiritual. They forget about the, the edification. They forget about the evangelism. You know, it'd be easy to get a group of people to go together in Tulsa and go to the zoo or something like that. And we could probably get a pretty good group of people. But then if we decide to go door knocking, hmm, that's a little bit more difficult to get. You see what I'm saying? That's the character of the church at Sardis. That's the kind of thing that he was talking about. And then he said, For I have found thy works, I found not, I have not found thy works perfect before God. In other words, they had not come to maturity in their works. Then you have the correction. The correction is found in verses 2 and 3, and he said, Be watchful and, and strengthen the things that remain, that are ready to die. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Now, the correction, he began by saying, be watchful. You know, being watchful, it cannot be overestimated. You know, the fact is, we need to be vigilant within our lives. And that simply means we need to be aware of what's going on within our lives and what's going around on outside of our lives. What hinders us from doing what's right what keeps us from doing those things that we know that we ought to be doing? Why are we making excuses for those kind of things and all the things that would go along with it? If we are not vigilant, brethren, we're going to apostatize. Those who will not stand strong and be vigilant and be watchful are going to simply go back into the world. And then uh, Jesus said, and strengthen the things that remain. Now the things that remain are those things that, that were still right within the congregation. It probably is a reference to those few that were doing the right things. And he says strengthen what remains. In other words, you let that little bit of light that's left in the congregation, you let it be active and involved so that it will strengthen the rest who are in there. In other words, what remains will be good seed for good spiritual works. You let it be active and don't hinder it. Now what happens in a lot of congregations is that those that are dead destroy the good works of others. And we have to be really careful that that's not what's happening. The life was the flicker of hope for the church in Sardis. I remember when Jeremy was in high school, he was doing a little bit of preaching for me when I was overseas and different things like that. And Jeremy started to go to a congregation, and I don't remember how it all worked out for him to go to this particular congregation. But he would go to that little congregation and just kind of help it out a little bit. And he, he'd come back discouraged and, and because it was so few and they weren't very active at that particular time. And I said, you know, you've got to remember the Lord's church in that location is the flipper of hope for that people, that community. And you are the flipper of hope for that church. Well, you know, either we are the active part and we then encourage others or we're not the active part and we discourage others. And we have to ask ourselves, which is it? Now, the question then ought to be asked, well, how could the church in Sardis bring back life? Well, that's answered in three ways. The first way he says, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. In other words, remember the gospel. You've been taught the gospel. You remember what you have received and what you've heard in the past. 
Do you realize that what motivates a person to become a Christian is what motivates a person to remain a Christian? There's no real difference. What motivated you to become a Christian? Well, I hope it was the sacrifice of Jesus. You saw your spiritual need. You saw the things where you were. You saw the sin that you were involved in. You saw the result of your sin. And it motivated you to become a Christian. You know what will keep you from going off into apostasy? Remember the things that you've seen and heard. Remember the things which you've received, the gospel, and the things that you've heard concerning the gospel. And then he said, and hold fast. That's the second key. How can the church in Sardis bring back life? Hold fast. But you know, what's unique about this is that this is not the same word that's used in other texts. In fact, this particular word in the original is completely different. It's unique. It's different from the rest. This particular word literally means keep. Keep hold or keep watch. And it's the idea of like keep the faith or keep the commandments. In other words, do not stray away. Keep yourselves in the tr gospel. Keep yourself in the truth. It's a little bit different word and it carries a little bit different meaning. And the church at Sardis needed to hold on and keep those things. Now some have said, well this is a reference to what would happen to Sardis. And maybe it is, I don't know. Or maybe it's a lesson they should have learned about what happened to Sardis. And it really fits the illustration of holding on to like a cliff. Here it is, Sardis, 1,500 feet above the, the floor of the valley. And they then are up there and they needed to hold fast. And the approaching army was able to seize the city because they did not hold fast. They did not keep hold. They fell. And the last thing he says, repent. Now we've talked about repentance on numerous occasions and I think all of us recognize what repentance is. Repentance begins with a change of mind. I hope all of us know that. The church at Sardis needed to have a change of mind about some things, did they not? Well, yeah, there are only a few that were doing what's right. They needed to have a change of mind they need to, to change their mind about doing what's right. They were doing what's wrong. They were actively involved in things that didn't make a lot of difference. And they needed to do what was right. They needed to have a change of mind about such matters. But is the change of mind all there is concerning repentance? No. There is no way you could ever convince anyone that's ever truly repented that it's just simply a matter of mind. Matter of change of mind. You remember the letters to the books of, or the books, or the letters to the church in Corinth? In the fifth chapter of the first book to the Corinthians was about a man that had his father's wife that's what the text says, and that's what the text indicates. And we're not going to go into detail about that. But the church, Paul instructed the church there to withdraw from that matter, mat, uh, that man. Because he said, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. In other words, one bad apple is going to make the whole bushel of apples to rot. And his influence would have a great impact upon the rest of the church. Have you ever noticed this? And I've noticed this all the way through my work as far as the Lord's church is concerned. That, you know, if you want to reduce the size of your Bible class, it just takes one person. And all they got to do is just quit going to Bible class 
and they're going to have an impact upon somebody else and they're going to cause somebody else to quit going to Bible class. And next thing you know, there's a group of people that decide, I'm just not going to go to Bible class anymore. And that's the way the impact works. I mean, that's the way it works. And so we have to then look at ourselves and we have to say, you know, I'm not going to be that kind of person because I know that I'm going to have an impact upon other people. I'm going to be here. And when I need to be in attendance, I'm going to be in attendance so that I can have the proper impact upon other people. Well, that man was having an impact on the church of Corinth. But the Corinthians didn't even understand that. In fact, it appears the Corinthians were even bragging about it. They were saying things like, oh, just look how graceful we are. Look how merciful we are. We'll be in fellowship with this man that has his father's wife. Oh, how foolish those Corinthians were. But the Corinthians must have listened to the apostle. And the Corinthians then did what the apostle said. And in 2 Corinthians, you know what happened? The man repented. And Paul then talked about repentance. You remember the statement, godly sorrow leadeth thee to repentance? That was in reference to this man who was having his father's wife. He had godly sorrow. But that godly sorrow wasn't just enough of itself. He needed to quit living with his father's wife. And he did. But there appeared to be some in Corinth who, I mean, man, when they decided to withdraw fellowship, they then withdrew fellowship and they wouldn't have fellowship with him even though he had repented. Even though he had a changed mind, even though he had godly sorrow, even though he changed his life as a result, they did not forgive him. And Paul then in 2 Corinthians exhorted them to forgive. We need to be a forgiving people, but we also need to be a repenting people. And so the three keys then to the growth of Sardis was to remember the things you've received and heard, the gospel. To hold fast, to keep those things, and then to repent. Well, the next we have the call. And that's found in verse 3 in the letter to the, to the church at Sardis. He says, If therefore thou shalt not want, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now, this is the consequence, remember. That's what this is actually talking about. This is the consequence if they do not make the changes that Jesus gave concerning the corrections. They needed to correct some things. And so notice the condition, he says, if therefore, if therefore, thou shalt not watch. If you're not going to be vigilant, if you're not going to do what I said, if you're not going to do as I commanded you, if you're not going to be vigilant, then watch next. And so these things then is the are the consequences of not being vigilant. If watchful, they will remember the gospel. If watchful, they will hold fast, keep. If watchful, they will repent. But if they're not watchful, they're going to follow the same path and they're going to be lost. Now Christians need to be watchful for the second coming. There's no doubt about that. I will come as a thief. We need to be watchful for the second coming. But we also need to be watchful what, of the things that we think, the things that we say, the things that we do. Now, I've heard people say, well, I can say anything I want. Well, no, you can't either. Not if you're bright on your tongue, you can't say anything that you want. Not if you're watching the things that you say, the things that you think, the things that you do. You can't say just anything that you want to say. We have to be careful with such matters. Now, Jesus said, here's the reason why. 
Now, they need to be watchful. They need to look to those few that were doing right and follow their example. They need to look at themselves in order to, to repent of the things that they have done wrong. But Jesus said, I will come as a thief. Now, not a thief in the sense of covetous or greed or harm. That's what a thief, how they come, and that's the way they come. But he will come as a thief in the sense, and only in the sense of unannounced and unexpectedly. That's how he's going to come. All the announcements that have ever been made have already been made. He's going to come unexpectedly. If we don't listen to the announcements that we already have, we're not going to listen to any new announcement. Now there's also a sense of secrecy as far as the thief is concerned. But you know, that's not true with the second coming. Think about this for a second. In Revelation 1 and verse 7, he said, every eye shall see him. You know, the thief, he's banking on the fact that nobody sees him. He's going to sneak into the house. That's why a lot of robberies are done at night, so that nobody sees. And he's going to sneak into that house, and he's going to try to get away in secret. But that won't be true with the second coming. Every eye shall see him. Now, if we're not ready, what's going to be the result? How sad. We're going to say to the rocks, fall on us. We're going to say to the cliffs, fall on us. We're going to say, you know, to, we want to be destroyed because we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So there's a sense in which we need to understand that we're going to see him that day. And we must stand prepared. Now in order that there is no misunderstanding, Jesus said at the end of this particular section, thou shalt know, uh, not know, brother, thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now we know all kinds of date setters and those that, that think they know the end of time and how that's all going to take place. But all men ought to know that Jesus is coming, but no person knows when he's going to come. Now all of us need to know, and every single person needs to know he's going to come, but nobody knows when. And this is nothing new. Jesus taught this in the Olivet Discourse, or the Olivet Sermon, the Sermon on the Mount of Olives. In Matthew 24, and verse 42, Jesus said, Watch therefore, ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Ye know not what hour. I remember standing there talking to a man, having a discussion with him, and he says, well, you don't really believe that, do you? Well, yeah, I do believe it. Jesus said, no man knows it. Yeah, I believe it. No man knows. And even though there's all kinds of people that will stand there and make time frames and all kinds of things like that. But the fact is, we do not know. That's what Jesus said in the gospel record. And that's what he said in the message to the church at Sardis. We do not know. No man knows. And so all men ought to stand prepared at all times for the coming of the gospel. And the final thing is the challenge. And that's found in verse 5. He that overcometh, which is a common statement found in here. This is talking about the person that has victory. The person that's been liberated. He that overcometh. The same shall be clothed in white garment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now notice the threefold benefit of, of overcoming. Now the first one is he will be clothed in white garment. This is a reference to purity in this particular case and holiness. You know, in this life, we have, 
I mean, we all have imperfect lives. But in the heavenly reward, Christians will be arrayed with perfect purity. And his name written in the book of life. Now this is a reference to the genealogy of the faithful of all time. And what I mean by that is the faithful of the Old Testament as well as the faithful of the New Testament. And you go back to the Old Testament and you notice that, you know, they gave all kinds of genealogies. They gave genealogies concerning Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They gave genealogies concerning the tribe of Judah. They gave genealogies concerning the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Simeon. And all those people listed in those different genealogies show that they belonged to this particular person or belonged to that particular tribe. Well, the book of life is the genealogies of God's children. It's those who are written in that book of life are going to receive the benefits, the inheritance as God's children. I don't know about you, that's the book that I want to be in. I want my sins blotted out, but I do not want my name blotted out of the book of life. But if the church in Sardis and the individual Christians in Sardis did not do the things that Jesus called upon them to do, their name would be blotted out. In other words, they would be disowned by the Father. They'd be no longer in that genealogy record. And then the third benefit is he says, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Well, isn't that reminiscent of Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33? You remember the passage. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my father which is in heaven. And whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my father which is in heaven. Jesus made a tremendous promise that, that if you confess God before men, he will also confess, or if you confess Jesus before men, he will also confess you before God. And I believe you have an exact uh, understanding of that in Matthew the 10th, or Matthew the 16th chapter with Simon Peter. Simon Peter confessed Jesus, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus then in return said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter had confessed Jesus, and Jesus then confessed Peter, and actually gave him some information that he did not have previous to this. Well, don't you want Jesus to confess you before God, before his angels? If your name is confessed before God and before his angels, that's almost like reading the book of life, the genealogy. But here, he's my brother. He's the one that's been faithful. He's the one that's been true. And our names then will be written in that book of life. Not only are the conditions clear, clear the proper choice is also clear. And you know what that proper choice is. You, you have the final exhortation. This is one of those three things that are found in every single one. And I separated it because it is the same in every single one. It's a final exhortation. And it's at the, at the near end, not at the absolute end as it is in this particular letter, but in some of the letters, it's in the near to the end of those letters to those seven churches. But the final exhortation is, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now this is reminiscent of what Jesus said on a number of occasions when he preached. It was very not unusual for him to make this same statement. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now this is actually a command to listen. And we need to listen to what Jesus said said to the churches but we need to listen to what jesus said within his within the gospel records as well and it really stresses 
the importance of hearing spiritual truths. Now, he that hath an ear is everybody. I mean, who doesn't have ears? Well, there may be a few, but they still have ways to listen, don't they? And so we have to still listen. It's a reference to every single person. But at the same time, notice how personal it is. He that hath an ear. In other words, what I'm saying is this. I cannot hear for you, and you cannot hear for me. I've got to listen to the message, and you have to listen to the message. He that hath an ear is for every person, but it's a personal message. And it's not talking about hearing audible sounds. That's not what this is talking about. I mean, we know all kinds of people that hear the audible sounds, but they don't act upon those sounds. No, it's like Bill's dress. It's actually talking about heeding the things that he said. Those benefits given to the church of Sardis are not any benefit whatsoever if they did not act upon those things. Just like repentance. Repentance is not repentance if it's only in the mind. It's got to result in the things that we say and the things that we do. If we truly repent, we'll change the way we think. We'll change the way the things we say. We'll change the things that we do. Every person must understand it's not merely a matter of hearing. It's a matter of eating. I always think about one particular fellow, and him and his wife would go to lecture ships all over the brotherhood. I mean, they would travel literally hundreds of miles, and even probably a thousand of miles on a couple of occasions in order to attend the lectures. But you know what was really sad about that is? They were good at hearing, but they weren't good at doing it. In fact, they really weren't, although they, they attended each day or each Lord's Day, and they were good about attending, but they really were not good about working. They were good hearers, but they did not heed. And thus, a final question is in, in order. Are you listening? I'm serious. Are you listening? I'm not talking about merely hearing. I'm talking about are you listening to the words that Jesus gave to the church at Sardis? Will you heed the things that he said? This morning we do want to offer the invitation. There may be someone that would like to respond to it. If you're not a Christian, you can become a Christian this hour by faith and confession and baptism. Or if you are a Christian, but need to repent and need to turn back to God. You know you haven't been holding fast to the doctrine. You know you haven't been holding fast to what Jesus taught. You know you haven't been keeping the things that he said. You're subject to the invitation. Will you have the courage? fortitude, the mindset to do what's right. Will you come as together we stand and sing to encourage you? Jesus is taking you.